We have that reflection on the requisites every night. We chant it so often that we start to take it for granted, but it's good to reflect on it. It reminds us of how much we're in debt to the rest of the world, just by the fact we have this body that we have to maintain. We're born with this big gaping hole, this mouth that, as John Lee says, can eat whole buffaloes and cattle and still not be full. What comes in goes out the other side and just keeps on needing more, more, more. And the animals, it's not that they are willingly giving their lives to us. Even if your diet is vegetarian or vegan, there's still all the animals that have to die just so that plants can be harvested and brought protected from pests. And there are all the people who have to do the work. This applies to all the requisites. A lot of people have to work really hard simply so that we can be alive. And so what are you doing to pay back the debts? In Thailand they have the concept they call Chao Gam Nai Wain, which literally means you're your karmic debt collectors. In other words, people with whom you've had debts not only in this lifetime, but in previous lifetimes, you have no idea what those debts are. So what are you doing to repay the debts? Well, we practice. As the Buddha said, one of the best ways you can repay your parents is to get them to practice too. But if they can't practice, at the very least, you dedicate the merit of your practice to them. And you wish all beings your goodwill. It's one of the standard beliefs that if some face shows up in your meditation, it's somebody that you have a debt, a debt with, and maybe they could use a little bit of your merit. So you dedicate the merit to them, wish them goodwill, then get back to your meditation. But always keep in mind that as long as we're alive, we still keep creating these debts. The only people who don't have any debts are arahants. As the Buddha said, they're the only people who eat the alms food of the country without any debt. And if you're, even if you're not a monk. The fact that you're eating, okay, you're creating debts. So this should be a spur to get out of this system. One of the factors of the path is right livelihood, and it's the factor that's explained the least. It's explained in the most vague terms. Just the disciple of the noble ones keeps abandoning wrong livelihood, keeps himself going or herself going with right livelihood. Doesn't explain much. But you can think about it. How do you maintain your well-being? The more you can find your inner resources to maintain that, the less you're leaning on other people, and the more you have to offer to them. This should be one of our motivations for practicing, both so that we can get ourselves out of debt. And as the Buddha said, uh, as you start attaining the noble attainments, the payback for people who support you gets, grows exponentially. In other words, they benefit from giving, giving to you. This is not licensed to eat everything you want when you reach those attainments, but it is licensed to make you realize, okay, by doing the practice you can pay people back. Because you look at the lives of the great Johns. And a lot of them had a lot of karmic debts. In fact, there's a belief that the Ajahns had the most psychic powers are the ones who are most in debt to other people. They needed the psychic powers to repay those debts. They needed to do good on a large scale. And even the Ajahns who man managed to stay pretty much alone. There's the case of Lumbu Wan, 
He spent all of his life up in the forest, not only of northern Thailand, but also in northern Laos, northern Vietnam, southern China, northeastern Burma. When he finally came back to northern Thailand, he didn't even know what paper money was. They hadn't had paper money when he was still a layperson. He lived pretty much alone. But then he was discovered. In the last years of his life, he was thronged with people. So it was the debt he had to repay. Fortunately, he had the wherewithal to repay it. So the attitude that many people have that they're somehow privileged and somehow society owes them a lot, that's not a Buddhist attitude. The attitude's the other way around. We, we all are in debt to one another. And yes, other people who are indebted to you, but also you have to remember you're indebted to a lot of other people. The fact that every day that you're feeding, getting new clothes, getting new shelter, getting new medicine, it's all incurring a debt. So you have to look for your inner resources. This is why you have to pay very attention to what you're doing as you practice. The inner resources are there. It's through them that you're going to be able to repay those debts. But you're not going to see them unless you pay careful attention. Really look at what you're doing. We meditate not just to go through the motions of sitting here with our eyes closed, but you really want to see. When greed comes up, how is it coming up? When anger comes up, how is it coming? When delusion comes, how do you recognize delusion? without being deluded by it. It requires that you pay careful attention. Because the resources are there, it's simply that we haven't seen them, and so they go unused. That's why you pay careful attention, that you do have this ability to develop these very simple skills, mindfulness, alertness. Keeping things in mind that are worth keeping in mind, being alert to what you're doing. It's all very, very basic. But it's by paying careful attention to what's really basic that we can really make a difference. This is why the forest of chants don't go into long explanations of the Dharma or of what we might say highfalutin Dharma concepts. They focus on the basics. Keep looking back. It's like when you're learning a sport. If you get really good at noticing your backhand, say, when you're playing tennis, or your swing when you're playing golf. I mean, the really great athletes are the ones who look very, very carefully at little things like that. Take them apart and then put them back together in the best possible way. Well, look at your mind. Take it apart into its most simple compounds. And try to put it back together in a better way. When an unskillful thought comes up, how do you recognize how to take it apart? Well, we talk about the three fabrications. It's the way you breathe. It's bodily fabrication, verbal fabrication. How do you talk to yourself about the issue? And Buddha takes that apart into Directed thought and evaluation. The directed thought is focusing on a topic and evaluation is what you tell yourself about it. So what, focus, what topics are you focusing on? Are they really good for you? Do you do this just out of habit? Can you change the habit? It requires you be determined. But realize it's just that simple sort of thing. You direct your thoughts in a particular direction and you start talking to yourself, making comments. So if something unskillful comes up, direct your thought in a new direction. Make new comments. And there's ver <clears throat> that's verbal fabrication. Then there's mental fabrication, which is feeling a perception, what feeling tones are you developing, say through the way you breathe, through the way you think. But most importantly, what are your perceptions? What are these images that the mind uses to send instant telegrams to itself? Can you catch those? You have to be very intent on watching to see them, because they flicker through the mind very quickly, like the subliminal messages that get put on TV. 
So everything you need to pay back those debts is in, here inside. It's simply that you slough over things, don't pay careful enough attention to what you're doing, what's going on inside, and the results that you're getting. We may keep settling for the same old way because we feel comfortable that way. It's like an old shoe. It's been pinching you in the same place for years and years and years, but it's the only shoe you know. It's up, it's up to you to decide. Do you want to keep on being pinched that way because it's going to be bad for you in the long run? Or are you going to learn how to adjust to new shoes that are actually better for you? And once you decide you've, you're not happy with the results, and if you even if you decide you're happy with the results, it's okay and you've survived so far this way, remember you're still creating a lot of debts. And are your debt collectors satisfied with the results? And John Lee makes this point again and again and again, that if you have something that's really good to give them, they'd leave you alone. But you haven't developed much in terms of your your virtue, your concentration, your discernment. They can really make life tough. So it's good to put an edge to your practice by reminding yourself that you are in debt. We don't arrive in life entitled. We arrive in life in debt already, just simply by the fact that we're born. And then beyond that, the fact that we have to keep surviving, have to feed and feed and feed to keep surviving. So you make sure that your livelihood is right. For lay people, this means you don't deal in anything that involves killing, stealing, any of, any of the, breaking any of the precepts. Or being engaged in a livelihood that has to depend on other people get, developing more greed, aversion, and delusion. For monks, this means you have to be very careful about how you obtain things. No hinting, no scheming, no belittling. You'd wonder how, why belittling is in that is in that list. Well, there are times when I've actually seen people say, I don't think you're up to giving this, and so on, so I'll show you. That's wrong livelihood. Pursuing gain with gain, giving little rewards to people who make large donations. All of that is not allowed, which means you have to keep reflecting again and again how you live in this world, how you, what kind of weight you place on it. You have to become very circumspect in your feeding, basically. And it makes you more and more sensitive to the fact that, yes, you do live in this world by feeding on it. And remember the Buddha's comment that what we all have in common as beings is that we have to feed. And where there's feeding, there's going to be conflict. It's the only true debt-free way of living is to get out of the cycle entirely. Otherwise, the debts keep piling up. This is why you can never rest content with saying, well, the practice is good enough for me. Because it's not just about you, it's also about all those debts you've got. And how are you going to pay them back? 